Another one of our monthly Lunch and Learn lecture series. We are uh, so glad you sort of braved the weather to, uh, to come out today and, uh, and listen to uh, what I think is going to be a fascinating talk today. We're, we're going to give you sort of a behind the scenes look at the monumental effort of building a, a new museum and, and what it means to conserve a, a collection that belongs to all of us, belongs to the people of Tennessee, and how it's been taken care of, and uh, we have a very special guest for you today. My name is Jeff Sellers. I'm the Director of Education and Community Engagement, and again, I'd like to thank you all for coming. Um, as we eat our lunches and listen to the program today, uh, be mindful there's trash cans throughout, and, um, and uh, you can dispose of your lunches as, as you go out this way. Also, I'd like to say, uh, as always, we'd love to have you join us on this journey into a new museum, into a new future for all of us, by becoming a member of the Tennessee State Museum Foundation. This is the best way for you to connect with us and for us to connect with you and to uh, really be a part of this journey and help uh, make this museum the best that it can be. We need your help as much as anybody. So we encourage you to uh, seek us out online at tmuseum.org and become a member or um, maybe buy a membership as a holiday gift uh, this time of year, okay? Uh, without further ado, let me go ahead and introduce to you our very special guest today. His name is Mark Biner, uh, and uh, Mark joined the field of conservation through his apprenticeship training from H.S. Bynum and Son Picture Restores in Newcastle uh, upon Tyne, England. Uh, so he comes to us from a, 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 a distance away from Tennessee. But Mark is a third generation conservator. He graduated from Byham Shaw School of Art in London with a BA in Fine Arts and from Northumbria University with an MFA with distinction. In 2002, he started a conservation studio in London and worked for private clients. Some of his clients have included Christie's Contemporary and the Tate Liverpool, uh, the British Museum, as well as English Heritage and Royal Collections. In 2004, he moved here to the United States and gained permanent residency in 2006. He has worked for uh, many federal museum projects, including the National Air and Space Museum, uh, the Titanic Exhibit, and he's worked on the Corona camera. I'm sure he'll share all of these a little bit more in depth. He has a very distinctive background. And he also worked with us uh, in 2004 on a very large exhibit called the Ralph Collection that we have here at the Tennessee State Museum. And that's when he really became our colleague and our friend. He continues to be. He's got a great team um, uh, of conservators here that's helping us conserve our collection. Let's help bring Mark to the uh, lecture today. Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. And, um, uh, thank you for all for coming. And thanks, Jeff, for that fantastic introduction. So uh, I'm the co-owner of uh, Bynan Art Services, and we're based out of North Carolina. We've been hired by the state of Tennessee to head up the conservation project for the new, um, for the new Tennessee State Museum, which is situated over at Rosa Parks Boulevard. Um, this project entails many things, uh, but our main priority is the safety and correct care of all the artifacts that have been designated for the new exhibit. As you can see, I'm showing you um, some artist impressions um, of the new exhibit. Uh, you can look these up. They're on uh, tnmuseum2018.org. It's, um, it's an interesting site and gives you a good idea of what you have to come. Um, 
do note, though, that these are just illustrations and uh, not the actual artifact layout or location. So, uh, the project. Uh, what I'll be talking about today is an overview of the conservation project. Um, I'll show you some examples of previous work to illustrate the diversity of projects we as conservators um, get involved in. Uh, I'll introduce you to the team who are working so hard to safely prepare these artifacts for display. And I'll explain the process along with examples from this exhibit. Um, as Jeff said, uh, I'm third generation. This is my grandfather here. Um, I feel rather privileged to have grown up in this field. And uh, I care a lot about the preservation of cultural property, um, which is why I, why I do this. Uh, so le let me go on and ask, uh, what is conservation? Um, this is a quote from the American Institute of Conservation of Historical and Artistic Works. Um, conservation encompasses actions taken toward the long-term preservation of cultural property. Conservation activities include examination, documentation, treatment, and preventative care, supported by research and education. And as a member of AIC, uh, we abide by the code and ethics and guidelines for practice. So let me show you a project um, where a whole collection was rehoused. Uh, this is Ranger's House in Greenwich, London. Uh, it's the Werner Collection. Um, it's a collection of nearly 700 works of art collected by Sir Julius Werner. He, uh, his dates were 1850 to 1912. Um, this is my wife, Jane, and also my business partner. She was the head conservator on this project for English heritage. So not unlike this project that we're working on today, all the items had to be assessed, treated. There were curators, external ec conservators, designers, and fabricators, all working together to get this finished. So let me run you through a few pro uh, previous projects. This is the Royal Academy in Piccadilly, London. Um, this is the, this uh, room. room here, um, is the salon and it was designed by William Kent in 1720. Um, so they were restoring this room, and they discovered on the cove, which the cove is an area that is between the wall and the ceiling, um, there was a painting by William Kent. Uh, unfortunately, it was underneath 14 layers of paint. Uh, so that's it's me in the top corner working on this cove. And not only was it just 14 layers of paint, there was another painting between it. So we had to excavate very carefully. And um, this is what we came up with. You may see here, this is uh, Cupid, this is Psyche, and this is Mars. Uh, so it's a classical interpretation all around the wall. Um, to give you an idea of the time this took, uh, one small square inch took us a whole day. So um, it was uh, quite an intense work, and as, uh, as far as I know, this is still going on. So um, also, uh, whilst I was working for Conservation Solutions Incorporated up in DC, I worked on this spy satellite for the National Air and Space Museum. This was a fascinating piece, and I uh, thoroughly enjoyed working on it. There was a multitude of different types of materials I had to deal with. And not only that, um, I, I was told when this entered the collection at the Smithsonian, it was partially classified. So there was very little people knew about it. And I had to totally disassemble it, uh, clean it, and um, put it all back together again. It was a, it was a big project. Um, and its history is really interesting. I haven't got time to talk about it now, but uh, look it up. It's a fascinating piece of equipment. Also with CSI, um, I had the privilege of working on um, some Titanic objects. Uh, these uh, were uh, on a touring show, and every time they'd been on a uh, display, they would um, come back and we'd have to assess them and make sure that there was no deterioration in their uh, condition and also do uh, minor treatments to them. So um, as you may know, or you may not know, um, Oh, sorry, uh, here we go. And this, uh, this is uh, more recent. This is at the, the Nasher in, uh, in North Carolina. Um, 
We've done a lot of work for them. I specialize in um, polychrome sculpture and gilded artifacts. Um, here you can see that um, there was some uh, quite a substantial deterioration in this uh, artifact. Also, it had had a lot of treatment before that I had to reverse because it, um, it was incorrect. And um, this is the uh, piece after treatment. Um, so uh, one of the um, duties that a, a conservator often has to perform is um, uh, doing condition reporting. And as Jeff mentioned, we worked, I worked here on the Raoul exhibit, exhibit, which is down below here. Um, the top photograph, um, I'm doing the condition report for the Museum d'Orsay for this, um, the Hayes collection when it traveled to Paris. And um, we did it again when it came back and compared the notes to make sure that the condition hadn't changed. And it was the same with the Raoul exhibit. Um, Biltmore in Asheville, um, this, they're one of our largest clients. Uh, we've done many things for them in the past 10 years. Uh, this was a 18th century French frame, it was a mirror. It had been through many campaigns of um, restoration and regilding. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of it was lost. Uh, we had to do a lot of recarving. And um, this, it, as you can see here, um, there was a lot of um, insect damage as well. So this was a major job for this one frame. And this is it finished uh, down below. Same family, uh, different house. This is the Breakers. I mean, the family has been the Vanderbilts. Um, the Breakers is up in Newport, Rhode Island. This is an auricular style frame, um, English circa 1680. You've got the two before and afters here. Uh, I think they're pretty obvious. Um, this was a, a marvelous example of its, uh, of its type of frame. One thing that uh, I sometimes get the pleasure to do, and I wish I got it more, was to make a complete copy of a period frame. This was another job for the Hayes collection. And it was for, the, um, for a small Bernard painting. I um, carved it from oak. It was gessoed. And this is it being, uh, after it's been gilded and toned to suit the, um, suit the painting. So let's move on to the team and the process. Here we have um, two technicians on the left. We've got Remy on the top there and Alex on the bottom. And uh, Carla, our um, objects conservator on the right. Uh, on the left here, we have Leslie. Uh, she's another technician. And our textiles conservator um, we have here is Melanie. And she has a, her own room downstairs where she uh, works solely on textiles for the new exhibit. So the staging area. Um, this is where all the artifacts arrive from being either in storage or out on display. Um, we assess them here. They either stay for minor treatments or they go to the lab, which is where I work, in the back of collections, um, or they go out to external con conservation. Uh, we have some paintings out now, and we've got some paper and a uh, musical instrument. And um, when they come back and they're suitable for exhibit, they get stored back here, and they're cataloged and logged on these shelves, so we know their location very well. And, um, it's from there that they go to the mount makers. And then the mount makers are from a company called Design and Production. And they measure them. And um, with our instruction, they, they handle them. And they um, make the displays for the new museum. So uh, for those of you that have been coming to the museum since January, you will have seen this site uh, becoming more and more common. Um, I hope that it start, this is starting to explain some of the reasoning behind the removal of these artifacts. Um, some of these artifacts have been on display since the early 80s. Um, so they, they need a lot of care. Just because they were out on display um, doesn't protect them from environmental damage. Um, so throughout the year, we've been working with the museum staff designers to finalize the complex, complex list of uh, artifacts. And from these lists, we've been prioritizing objects of concern. These are items that may need extensive treatments, external conservation, or that's not suitable for display at this time. So let's see some examples. This is a prosthetic leg. It's Civil War. That um, number you see there is a session number. 
every object in the museum has an accession number. It's, it's a, a way of tracking it. Um, this is a before treatment of the prosthetic leg. Um, as you can see, there's the lamination of the leather from the foot. Um, there's corrosion on the uh, metal hardware. And there's this tear here in the fabric. This is a fabric that's placed over a wooden substrate with metal supports. And um, the fabric has a gesso base. And then it has an oil-based oil paint on top. So it's basically, it's painted to look like a leg. Um, it was quite a work of art. Um, this is during treatment, so you can see the dramatic change of um, the tests we've done here on cleaning. Uh, I've started trying to um, bring the tear back into its original position. Because of its age, it had become very brittle, and um, getting it back was rather hard. I do believe this was literally let in either in a barn or in a shed. Um, underneath, there was a lot of damage due to moisture. Gesso is made up of um, calcium carbonate and rabbit skin glue, and so it's uh, very susceptible to moisture. Um, around the top of the leg where it would have fitted to the patient, there was a lot of loss, and that's from the, the sweat and the heat that um, he produced whilst wearing this. Um, this is the, the bottom leg's been cleaned, and Carla here is reattaching the leather to uh, the substrate. Uh, the next image um, is an after treatment. So you can see now that the metal's been treated, it's clean, and um, everything is back where it should be, and it's ready for exhibit. The Sam Davis boot. Um, now, the Sam Davis boot, when it was out on display, didn't look too bad. But when we got it into the um, staging area, it uh, was pretty obvious in a different light that it had this white bloom all over it. Um, it turns out that this, um, this white is an old wax that's been applied. And it's just gone hard and turned white. So um, some of these projects we do, they're, they're very, um, some of them are quite in depth. And we've got to do quite a lot of work to them. Some of them, it's just a simple matter of removing something. Uh, this is the Sam Davis boot after treatment. And so now it reads much better to the viewer. Um, the, the other thing was is that the, the wax wasn't doing any harm to the boot. It's just unsightly. All right, gathering of overmounted men on Sycamore Shoals in 1780. This is by Lloyd Branson and painted in 1915. If, you'd see, if you've seen this painting over the last 30 years, it's been uh, upstairs and it's been framed in this thin wooden frame. Um, when I saw this, I knew that this wasn't the original frame. It was pretty obvious. Uh, so we did some research. And uh, Jim Hubler and I found um, a, a transparency in the files. And this is showing its original frame. So my dream was to find this frame and um, put it back on this painting. This painting took the artist many years to paint, and I just felt it was justified to uh, reunite it. Um, we looked all over. We were in the top of the War Memorial building. We were downstairs. We were in the back of storage. I was crawling all over the place looking for this. And um, I nearly gave up, and I was going to recreate this from this image uh, when um, our registrar uh, had an idea where it was. And lo and behold, there it was. And so we found it. Unfortunately, like a lot of frames, um, they're taken off not just because they don't fit into a space, but they've been damaged. This has had um, a number of treatments done to it. It's covered in bronze powder paint over the original gilding. This white you see here is an addition. It's plaster of Paris, and someone's just gone along with their finger and made some bad design in it. Um, the gold leaf, I did a, uh, a cross section and looked under the microscope to find out what the original surface would have been like. And so we can now, sorry, we can now bring this back to um, its original appearance and then uh, reunite it with its painting. This is going to take a while. This will not be done probably until we install into the new museum. Steamboat by H.C. Uh, Payne in 1872. This was just behind us in the New South. It had been on display for many years. It had gathered a lot of dust. It hadn't been treated or cleaned when it went into exhibit. 
Um, you can't see very well here, but there was a lot of loss, a lot of small losses to the paint layer. You can see on the globe here, the wordings, a lot of it's been lost. There was some instabilities in the surface, but mainly it was just caked in dirt. Um, Remy did a great job here. She spent hours uh, vacuuming with a brush. She even uh, found a, uh, a mud dopper, like a wasp nest in there um, that she managed to suck out. And um, she uh, uh, did a great job on the minor in-painting um, that had to be done. It was just uh, um, small areas, but it was throughout the whole of the uh, artifact. And you can see here where the globe has areas missing and where she's in-painted it here. Um, so the after treatment, uh, what we were trying to achieve here is basically um, we were not trying to make it look like the day it was made, but so it represented its age, but it read better to the viewer and uh, didn't have any unsightly losses. So let me move on to external assessments and specialists. I've kind of jumped on a bit here. Um, here we have uh, on the top, we've got... Um, Valentine Enzingen and Ben Redmond, uh, who were specialists that came to examine the cannon. Um, Valentine's a chemist. He's the CEO of uh, Mooney Rem. And Ben Redmond is an EOD specialist for over 40 years. Um, below, we have our Nick Fielder here, that many of you know. Um, but I've got Mimi Levesque. Uh, she came to inspect the, the mummy. And, in September, when Jeff gave his talk on, um, on the mummy, it was that afternoon we closed down the exhibit and the Friday uh, she came and did her inspection. So, um, so these are the main areas of our concern. And, um, but what I'd like to uh, point out, uh, one of the most important things is dealing, dealing with a project of this uh, scale is uh, establishing the correct procedure when you come up against a against a problem. Uh, problem solving is a daily task. And um, here's one problem we came up against. Uh, it's the 12-pound bronze Napoleon cannon. It's no longer on display, if you've been around there this morning. Um, I brought in, before we examined this bronze cannon, um, Paul Mardikian and Claudia Comello from Terra Mer Conservation. Um, Paul and Claudia are specialist conservators dealing with metals. Paul's got a lot of experience on uh, military artifacts. Uh, he's worked on the U.S. Alabama, the Titanic, when I met, met, first met Paul. But uh, for 16 years, he worked on the Hunley. Um, he's uh, very experienced, as is um, Claudia. We came and we examined the cannon. It was needed uh, repatinating the surface was incorrect and so when we examined it and um, through our suspicions of what we'd been told there was a cannonball lodged down the cannon um, this was a highly corroded iron cannonball and uh, so Paul and Claudia were charged with researching how to uh, remove this projectile which is why we ended up with uh, Mooney Rem and Ben Redmond uh, the museum did a lot of research, and um, uh, Lisa Boudreau did some fantastic stuff up at the uh, Library and Archives. She found a couple of very good letters, and let me read you a little bit. Uh, it's not quite a letter, it's a statement. Um, this here says, I, Ben Johnson, do clarify that I believe that this cannon barrel to be the one and the same as the one which was brought to the Capitol grounds by John W. Morton, then Secretary of State, Tennessee. Fair enough. Then he goes on to say, this barrel was originally on wheels and stood in open ground until the wheels rotted from under it. I fired this cannon several times for John Morton on various locations, and I can identify it by its unusually large hole used in firing. And by that, I think he means the vent hole. So that was a little concerning, um, because when we did the measurements of the cannonball and the length of the barrel, we realized that there was a gap of about 12 inches between the cannonball and the back of the cannon. We didn't know what was there. We can't x-ray it. If we wanted to x-ray it, we would have had to have cleared this building to do a cobalt x-ray. Um, 
So we had to proceed with caution, which is why we brought in Munirem. Um, Jim Hubler uh, showed me this postcard. Um, this is the Jacks Memorial up on the uh, Capitol. Here's our cannon here. Now look down here, there's a ball of cannonballs. All right, we can refer back to that later on. So this all started about eight months ago. Uh, so there was a lot of planning involved in this. So we had to remove this from the um, exhibit. Now remember, when this was brought in, it was when this museum was first created. So that was like 1980. It was wheeled in from that elevator and put on display on its platform, and it sat there till um, just a couple of weeks ago. None of these walls is staged or anything was there when that was done. So when we came to move this out, we realized that we couldn't just wheel it out. We had to disassemble it. Um, it didn't fit through the corridors. So we had to make a um, platform to wheel it, wheel it down off its platform. We disassembled it. We took the cannon off and put it on a purpose-built cradle for it. And this was going to help us when we were treating it. And then we disassembled the um, carriage. And we were told, well, I was told, that this was an aluminum carriage. Well, it turned out it wasn't. It was made out of uh, cast iron. And it, believe me, it was made the job a bit different. Um, you can see how many people are trying to wheel that one wheel. And as you can see, the axle here had to be lifted over these display cases to get it out. So we stored the carriage for uh, conservation. And then we went down to um, the Tennessee Fire Service and Codes Enforcement Academy down in Bellbuckle. They kindly dug this trench out for us. And this is them bringing it in. And this is Ben Redmond. He's got a boroscope up the barrel there, and he's checking, checking it. We did a high, um, well, I should say they did a high um, pressure um, water treatment to it just to try and get rid of initial uh, loose uh, corrosion around the cannonball. Um, then they applied the Mooney Rem chemical. Now, the Mooney Rem chemical is mainly, um, it was invented to um, inert gunpowder. Uh, but one of its benefits is it corrodes, um, it, it dissolves iron corrosion. So this was applied to the front of the cannon, and it was also applied to the back through the flash hole. And it was left overnight. And also, it was put under pressure. This is a valve that they put on it and then put air pressure into it. So it was pressing into the, we wanted to break that seal that was around the cannonball. Day two, we removed it. This, a, uh, uh, this is one of their um, staff. He's cleaning out any of the um, corrosion that's come loose. Quite a lot came out that day. And this is a photograph down. Now you can see the cannonball. Before you couldn't. I, sadly, Ben has the photograph of the corrosion. But um, now you can clearly see the cannonball. But there's a very tight seal going around that. Um, so that became problematic. We pumped in um, hydraulic oil behind the cannonball. This is uh, where we're doing it then 15,000 pounds of pressure was applied to this. Um, nothing happened at first. We flushed it again, and we, pro we uh, proceeded to repeat this three times. Now, look here. This is very hot water pressure that's been applied to inside the cannon. And you can see it dries very quickly. Here, where it's still wet, this is where the cannonball is. So it's not transferring the heat. And then. After doing this for th three times, we applied um, two and a half thousand pounds of air pressure without a regulator. So the oil pressure is more like a slow push. When you put um, air behind it, it's like a big thump, like a big hammer blow to it. And um, it's a, it, it worked well. It pushed the cannonball out. And here we have it about four inches from the end. So uh, we were pretty pleased with this. And as you can see, this is the cannonball. And this is the corrosion that was keeping it in there. So we safely removed it. Nobody was hurt. And we no longer have this corroding cannonball down a bronze Napoleon cannon. And um, this is after the projectile was removed. You can see the back of the cannon now. It's safe. And this is the cannon waiting for uh, Paul Mardikian to work on it. And this is our other Brennan cannon. Um, so we, it, was a, it was a big project and the largest one we've done so far. And um, happily, it all worked out.
And that's, that's the end. Thank you. Perfect timing. I don't know if anyone has any questions. Perfectly acceptable. <laughs> yeah, you were there. I, I will add one thing that because of the time restriction we had, um, I did want to talk about the mummy, but um, unfortunately we, I didn't have the time. So if you like, I can quickly flick through these slides of um, the mummy and its. This is the mummy in its old uh, exhibit. It's been moved to its present exhibit. And these were comparable things we did. And um, this is Mimi Levesque's examination of it. And uh, these are the problems that we have with the mummy, that uh, it needs to be treated. But um, this is a, a talk in itself. And uh, maybe one day someone can, uh, can do that. So that was just what we didn't have time for. But uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. Uh, you know, this huge effort is just one part of this new museum process. There are several people, several teams that are all working or, you know, every day uh, to, to, make this, to make this thing happen. We have some of our folks here today that are, that are working on it. I'd just like to thank you guys for the work that they did. Let's give uh, our, some of our contractors and other state employees that are up here on this row around the fall for what they're doing. <laughs> well, folks, that about wraps up 2017's Lunch and Learn. We're so thankful that you participate with us each month. We've got a great lineup for you coming up in 2018 as we lead up to the new museum. So uh, stay tuned and come back to see us. Thank you.